Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is John Worth. I am uh, one of the volunteers on the North Coventry Township Environmental Advisory Council. Um, and I'm pleased to have you join us. Um, this, is, this is one webinar in a series of educational webinars that the North Coventry EAC is sponsoring. Um, this is actually our second of four. Um, I'll invite you to come back in about a month to hear about uh, the hidden lives of North Coventry's frogs and salamanders. That'll be on Tuesday, August 18th. And then on Tuesday, September 15th, from 7 to 8 p.m., Hawk Identification for Beginners. Those are the programs that we have coming <coughs> up. But tonight we have uh, a presentation by one of our EAC volunteers, Jessie Schiffler. She is a North Coventry uh, Township resident, and she's going to be talking about native plants. <coughs> Um, so I would like to, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, North Coventry Township for supporting our efforts in this, in particular Jim Marks, as well as Erica Batdorf. Um, and I'd like to thank Jesse for volunteering to give this presentation. I know that native plants are uh, a real passion of hers, so I'm certainly looking forward to hearing this, Jesse. I will uh, mute myself now and let you take it away. The presentation tonight is Native Plants in the Landscape making a difference one yard and garden at a time. Plants are my passion, not my profession. So everything presented today, I've learned from reading books, attending classes and seminars, obsessively researching native plants and studying plant lists from nurseries for fun. I also volunteer with a lot of great organizations like Natural Lands and Perfume and Watershed and get to talk to very knowledgeable people about plants and insects while clearing invasives and tending. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Albert Einstein said that. We're losing insects, birds, and other native animals at an alarming rate. Our highly industrialized agricultural system with its reliance on an overuse of chemicals, human overpopulation and subsequent deforestation for housing needs and ever diminishing open spaces are all contributing factors. We as homeowners have a responsibility to be stewards of the earth, improving our biodiversity by planting native plants. We want our non-native honeybees to thrive in our environment, which will only flourish with native plants. My husband and I are beekeepers, and the last time I gave this presentation, it was about, it was to honey beekeepers, so hence that last sentence. If I can do this in my yard, you can too. Anyone can put in a little work to plant these beautiful plants and reap the rewards of seeing so many wonderful insects. Take joy in the fact that you can bring life to your little piece of earth with just a few changes to how you see the world. We're going to cover three main areas in this, top, in this conversation today. What native plants are, how to choose the best plants for your needs, and some simple things you can do to get started. At the end, there are several pages of resources for more information and a list of nurseries for you to go find these plants. Our first topic is native versus non-native. A native plant, a native is a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. That's by Doug Tallamy. There's lots of definitions for the word native, but I prefer this definition because it is the most specific and encompassing. Why should we choose natives? They add biodiversity, they also want to grow here, so we don't need fertilizers or pesticides. And after they're established, you don't need extra watering. They provide food and habitat for wildlife. They bring us closer to nature and they are beautiful. They are the functioning base of a healthy ecosystem. They also provide host sites for butterflies and moths. Those are the, the only food sources those, butter, those caterpillars can eat. The nectar and pollen sources for thousands of insects, berries for birds, nesting materials for birds, and shelter for small animals. Talking about host plants, 
This is a monarch caterpillar on swamp milkweed. Monarchs and milkweed have co-evolved together to be, they can't live without each other. And on the right side of the screen is a fritillary caterpillar. It just climbed off of its host plant, which is a violet, onto this viburnum leaf. Just wasn't quite quick enough with my camera to get it on its host. Here are some more close-up pictures of those same types of caterpillars. And then the cutest caterpillar you'll ever see. You want these guys in your yard because they are bicycle swallowtail caterpillars. On the right side, you see it on its host plant, the spice bush. I planted this plant three weeks before I took this picture, and it already had this beautiful caterpillar on it. He curls up in the leaf to protect himself, to hide from predators. Um, he was a really lovely find. On the other hand, non-native plants may only serve one or two functions, if any. They may provide a temporary food source for some insects and birds, and they may provide shelter. But a lot of non-native plants come at a cost. If they are invasive, they may displace native plants, and they don't provide host resources. So that means the caterpillars have nothing to eat. And without caterpillars, there are no butterflies. For example, the non-native kudzu will host the native silver-spotted skipper butterfly that one species. However, the native oak tree that could have lived there had the kudzu not taken over would have hosted 454 species of caterpillar. At the same time, the kudzu also displaces the black cherry, which is a host for 324 caterpillars, and the willow, which hosts 247 kinds of caterpillars, the hickory that hosts 229, and the maple, for 223. That is a total of 1,477 species just between those five native trees that are lost due to the kudzu. Doug Tallamy's book, Nature's Best Hope, it's his latest book. Read it. It has lots more information and lots of statistics and data like that to support our cause. Choosing the right plants. Sarah Stein said, value the land for the life it harbors. Think of the wildlife you're looking to attract when you decide what plants you wanna put in your landscape. Do you wanna focus on all pollinators or butterflies specifically? How about birds? Maybe you wanna see more small mammals on a larger property. Think about what you wanna see and try to plant the plants that will attract them. I said before, my husband and I are beekeepers and the non-native European honeybee was what actually made me realize how much more I wanted to see native bees. And this native bee is a leaf cutter bee on Culver's root that I planted two years ago as a little plug from the plant sale with the CCBA. Once you know your overall goal of what you're trying to attract, there are lots of things to take into consideration. Observation, planning, and, and appropriate preparation are keys to a su successful project. You need to know your growing conditions. What soil are you working with? Most of us have clay soil. Are you getting full sun, part sun, full shade? What size is the area that you're trying to work with? And again, what are your goals? There are options for site preparation, which includes smothering, sod cutting, you can till the area, or you can solarize. And then you want to think about overall seasons of bloom and plan to have as many blooms as possible throughout many seasons in the year. You'll want to observe your property during several seasons to determine the growing conditions. Soil moisture can change dependent on season and slope of the land. The amount of sun an area will get changes during the day and throughout the year. So you want to make sure that you're taking those things into account when you pick the plants to put in those places. Also, the size of several things, the area you're working with, the size of the mature plants, because it's great to plant densely, but you don't want to crowd your plants. 
when you first plant an area, it may look a little sparse because you're taking into account the mature size of the plant and the size of your wallet. Depending on how you purchase your plants and where you purchase your plants, you could spend quite a bit of money putting in just one garden bed. And we talked also about the goals of what you want to attract, also maybe what you want to mitigate. You can put in a rain garden to mitigate rainwater runoff and help um, keep a lot of chemicals and a lot of runoff going into our streams. When you know your growing conditions and you choose your plants accordingly, you can have very happy plants. There's lots of native plants that love shady, moist soil. There's also lots that love every growing condition, from wet to dry, full sun to full shade. If you have a small space, choose native plants that stay small. If you have a large area and you want to fill it on the cheap, pick some aggressive spreaders and you, then you get more bang for your buck. This picture here shows pink turtle head. Um, I got it as plugs two years ago. And if you can see in these cute pictures, it's the best place to find little bumblebee butts. Um, they're one of the few bees that are strong enough to pry open the big blooms. So it's fun to watch them wriggle in and out. Proper site preparation is the difference between a successful, productive native plant habitat and an unsuccessful, time-consuming, and more expensive weed bed. Eliminating competition is the main goal of site preparation. Decide when you want to plant your seeds and start your site preparation accordingly. Solarization is when you use the heat of the sun in combination with black plastic or greenhouse plastic to kill vegetation that is already in place. So you mow the area, you cover it with plastic, you let it there for four weeks, you take off the plastic and let whatever is still grow and grow, then you recover it for another four weeks so that you kill the weed seeds in the soil bed. It is a longer preparation process but it is low cost and it is eco-friendly because it's no chemicals. Um, you're not breaking down the soil components. So you're left with the good soil that you had. You're just taking away the turf grass or the, the weed bed that you had there. You can also use a smother met method. You can cover with cardboard and mulch maybe, cover it for up to a year it may take, and then you can plant right through that in the following season. Um, the quickest way would be to rent a sod cutter and remove the top layer of vegetation, and then you can plant immediately. Um, it is a bit labor intensive, but if you want to work immediately, that would be a fast way to go. You can also use a tilling method. Um, it has to be done successively over several months to really get the weeds out the best, um, but it is an option. A timeline for solarization ideally would be to mow in May, cover with the plastic for May and June, uncover for a little bit in July, recover again at the end of July, and let it covered until September to sow your seeds in October. Most native seeds need at least one cycle of cold moist stratification, meaning they go through a freeze and thaw cycle open to the elements. Um, a lot of times it's a minimum of 60 days. Some seeds take longer. So if you set your timeline up to plant in the fall, that is the best for most native seeds. And then in the spring, you'll see a lot of new growth. This is an example of solarization that I did at my house. I put down the black plastic and I used 
essentially I used grass divots to hold down the sides and I just uh, held down the edges. It's very important to hold down the edges to increase the temperature and decrease the airflow. Um, so I held down the edges with some wooden rails that we had and some rocks. This project started at the end of May. It was a little later than I wanted it to, but um, I will be uncovering it this weekend to allow it to be open to the air for two weeks so that anything that's still growing or still viable in the seed bed will grow and then I'll recover it with plastic. We did the same thing at Hanover Meadows. The picture on the left it are the four corners of the new demonstration garden that we are putting in at Hanover Meadows. On the right is the day that we laid the tarp and we had grand plans to bury all of the edges for the best uh, solarization, you know, to seal it in very well. And as you can see, we could not even get the ground to break with our shovels. So we had to improvise and we did the same thing that we did at my house. We covered um, with, we covered all the edges with wood. We had strung some jute cord all across the middle. That way uh, it just had some extra protection. And in a couple more weeks, we will uncover it for two weeks let it open to the elements, and then we'll recover it again to plant native seeds in the fall. Another option for site preparation is to manually desod the area. I did not rent a sod cutter because it was a small area. It is still very hard to remove sod by hand, uh, but I could plant immediately. So this bed was done all in one day, um, and it has a mix of mints and senna and there's a dogwood tree there. Um, it's going to look really great in a couple of years. Another eco-friendly site preparation, I used my chickens. I spread scratch feed on the site every day for about three weeks and they removed all of the grass. They dug and dug down to the dirt which was great and then I planted all of those little bushes and there's lots of little flowers in, the, in there and um, luckily enough they let my chickens let the violets alone so they are still there and this year this is what that spot looks like um, it's hard to appreciate in this photo but the tall grasses are, have such a lovely texture this was taken at the end of June. Uh, so nothing was quite blooming yet. And then just the other day, I took this picture there. So you can see the beautiful Monarda blooming. Um, you can see some violets there. It's turned into a really nice bed for me. When you're deciding on your plants, remember to plan for all seasons of bloom from at least February to April. We have native plants that will bloom in February and some that are still holding on to blooms in October. It is best if you plant three different kinds of plants for each season and if you plant at least three of that plant. Um, most pollinators are specific to a certain bloom that they're kind of harvesting that day. So if you have at least three of something, they expel less energy getting nectar or pollen from it because it's there in one grouping. On this page, I give some examples of trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants that will meet the different bloom times. Patience is your best friend. Smaller plants, like plugs, are cheaper and transplant better than larger, more established plants. The key is then that you have to be patient. You don't have quite as much instant gratification. 
there's less risk of transplant shock and they get better rooted when they're smaller. And I always like to remember the first year they sleep because they're putting down roots, that second year they creep, there's slow growth, it is noticeable, and then that third year they are going to leap. And I've been really passionate about native plants for three years. So this year, my beds that I put in that first year are just looking lovely. Mountain mint is one of my favorite native plants. There are several kinds that are native here to PA. Um, on this picture on the left is the short tooth mountain mint. It gets the most pollinators of any plant I have ever seen. In fact, looking at it, it almost gives you vertigo. It is covered with so many different things that are flying and crawling. Um, it's amazing. And then there's purple coneflower, phlox, and swamp milkweed. Sometimes it's difficult, but if you can, choose the straight species. They have evolved alongside the local fauna, so they bloom at the right time for the insects and they produce berries at the right time for the birds. They're the right shape, the right color. They are just what the animals need. Sometimes it's hard to find street species, especially if the only place you're looking is Home Depot or Lowe's. I highly recommend, and at the end of this presentation, there's a list of native plant nurseries in our area. Within an hour drive, you can go to many, many native plant nurseries. And I like to get something from each of them because I want them to keep doing what they're doing. Hybrids and some cultivars are not always as beneficial as the straight species. Usually they are not. It depends what's changed about them but you can tell something is a hybrid or a cultivar because it has a fancy name. So for example, Circe's canadensis is our redbud tree. If it has a name in it that is in single quotation marks, it is a cultivar. Sometimes that isn't a big deal. If it is just a cultivar because it was selected specifically to stay a smaller size, it may not be a big deal. If it doesn't change the flower color, the flower shape, the flower size, the bloom time, the leaf color, it may not matter. But when you change a plant's leaf color, it means the chemical defenses of that plant are changed and therefore the insects that usually post on that plant may not be able to use it anymore. A lot of cultivars or hybrids provide little or no pollen because they are bred for double petals or, or a different flower shape and therefore they either don't make nectar or pollen or it's inaccessible to the insects that have co-evolved with it. You also want to think about design. Design is not my strong suit, I promise you, but I Think about what function am I trying to have this area serve? In this picture, eventually this area will be shaded for a picnic area. Um, you may want to put in something that attracts native bees or butterflies, or you're excited about seeing more birds. So maybe you wanna have a sitting area by a bush that gets berries on it so that you can attract birds to watch them. Are you looking to mitigate rainwater in a depression in your yard? Pick plants that get you what you want. Eventually this area will be shaded. Um, I, I tend to purchase smaller trees, so I have to be patient while they mature, but they're much healthier for it. These pictures are, I think, just about the only pictures in the whole presentation that are not of my yard, so, um, they are some examples of design. When you design for a meadow, you're providing plant diversity, food and habitat for wildlife, and it replaces other mowed areas. A woodland, you need to pick shaded, shade tolerant plants, and they're still going to 
flower and bloom and provide nectar and pollen, they just do so with limited light. A rain garden uses its deep root system to soak up rainwater and can really help those areas of your yard that get a lot of runoff. And you don't have to mow that foggy area anymore. There are lots of sources for you to find templates for pre-planned gardens. <clears throat> Down at the bottom of this slide is a link, but there are probably 20 pre-planned um, gardens on this website. It's a great resource. Here are some other resources. Prairie Nursery is actually a um, seed and small plug catalog, but it has pre-planned garden maps that you can purchase all of the, pl the plants and put them in, install them just like the picture. Um, that's wonderful for, for people like me who just don't know a lot or um, I, I'm not experienced in designing. I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, this is two different areas in my yard <laughs> two years ago. Um, the top one was last year we got a huge rainstorm and that was my backyard. So the top left is during that rainstorm. The top right is the rain garden that I installed this spring. So I apologize. I am the reason that we have not gotten much rain this year. Um, it's because I put in a rain garden and it has not once flooded. It, all of those plants are getting a lot bigger. Um, they look, it looks nothing like that now. And eventually the plants will get big enough that most of the grass will be crowded out. I will still have a lot of weeding to do, but I thought I was preparing for rains like you see on the left side. So I didn't want to take everything out and have just everything washed away. The bottom left is another area of my yard that would collect a lot of rainwater. The bottom right is that bed um, after, after, I think it might have been early this spring, potentially. Um, but then, as you can see, this is it a few weeks ago. So it has grown, that's just one year of those plants being in there. They've grown, they're happy, they really like it. They probably really like more rain. They're probably really happy right now with the rain we had earlier. But um, a little bit of patience and I have an established bed. Some things we can do just to start simple. Shrink your lawn. Add a new wildflower bed each season or add a hedgerow of native shrubs. You don't have to convert your whole yard, but evaluate what areas of turf you actually use for foot traffic, for kids to play on, for the dogs to go out, etc. And slowly turn the rest of the areas into native plantings. Too much water is wasted on irrigating lawns. Too many chemicals are used to try and get this green golf course. And all of those fertilizers end up in our drinking water and in our fresh waterways and kill organisms all the time. And we really just don't need to do that. We can't afford to do that anymore. The non-native grass Green grass, perfect lawn is outdated. It's from a, a time that we no longer belong to. I saw a meme on Facebook that showed a man in an old colonial clothing standing on a manicured lawn and it said, we don't dress like this anymore. Why do we landscape like this? Change how you see your yard. See the beauty in providing life to so many other creatures when you convert your lawn into a living landscape. Why fight nature when you can harmonize with it? Leave the leaves, it's free compost to nourish the soil. Most butterflies and moths overwinter in the landscape as an egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, or adult using leaf litter for winter cover. Great spangled fertilities and woolly bear caterpillars tuck themselves into a pile of leaves for protection from cold weather and predators. Red banded hair streaks lay their eggs on fallen oak leaves, which become the first food for the caterpillars when they emerge. Luna moths and swallowtail butterflies disguise their cocoons and chrysalis as dried leaves, blending in with the real leaves. 
mated queen bumblebees burrow only an inch or two into the earth to hibernate for winter. An extra thick layer of leaves is welcome protection from the elements. These are, there are many, many more examples um, cited on the Xerxes Society website. So this is a picture that I took in late March. Um, you can see the peach and cherry trees are just starting to bloom. And I wish I had taken the picture a couple hours before this because I took the picture right after I had chopped and dropped all of the remaining stems from last winter. So I let everything standing all winter provided uh, hibernation sp spots for lots of insects. And just in case they hadn't emerged yet, I just drop them on the ground. They'll slowly break down and add back into the soil instead of carting them off to be disposed of in the garbage and collect or create more carbon dioxide and, and carbon issues. This is that same view, the same bed in early May when the fruit trees have mostly leaked out and the ground ivy and hem bitter blooming. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then this is the same picture again, beginning of July, full of life, and the whole group of coneflowers behind the fully leaved apple tree. You can't even see, it's a patch that's 12 feet wide. Um, but there's so much life in that little patch just because I left the leaves and everything comes back rich and vibrant. There you go, there are the coneflowers. Leave old growth until at least April. It harbors life. Many native bees use hollow stems to overwinter. Leaving old growth until the weather warms enough for these species to awaken will help increase pollinator populations. And many bird species that are returning from their winter migration sites are hungry and will use the standing seed head for much needed sustenance. Here's another patch. This I took, I remembered to take the picture before I chopped it all down. It is mountain mint and it wasn't taken down until April when I saw the native bumblebees flying. And because I don't do much cleanup, I get to see cool things like this in the leaves. There are a few great chrysalis you'll see if you leave the leaves. On the left is the variegated fertility. I'm sure of that one. On the right, I don't know what is in that guy. Um, and then here's the mountain mint bed in May. So you can see it is certainly not hindered at all by the fact that I let all of that standing all winter. Um, and there it is, just starting to bloom in July. I just can't get enough mountain mint. So here are some more pollinators. Um, it blooms from July through September. Uh, so many, so many different things on it. <clears throat> These are all signs that I have either gone through a program for or met the criteria for um, cues to care. It helps my neighbors, it helps your neighbors understand that you are making conscious decisions to improve your piece of the world so that they don't think that you're just a derelict homeowner or a, a lazy guy who doesn't mow his lawn. You're doing it for a purpose. Weeds are friends. Weeds by definition is a plant that is not valued where it is growing and is usually of vigorous growth. That's from the Webster Dictionary. But many weeds provide nectar and pollen sources and prevent erosion. So the word's gotten a bad connotation, but I love many weeds and appreciate how abundantly they want to grow and provide life. For example, purple dead nettle, ground ivy, henbit, dandelions, clover, these are some of the earliest sources of nectar and pollen. You can see this bumblebee just digging away at that henbit. Fleabane and violets are two of the native um, weeds, quote unquote weeds. Um, those other ones are not native, they're naturalized, meaning they grow here without our intervention. Um, they serve a purpose. These two plants uh, were two quote unquote weeds that I let grow to see what they would become. And I was so fortunate they turned out to be a late bone set and goldenrod. 
two very important fall nectar sources. Had I pulled them when I first saw them growing, I would not have gotten the benefit of having these plants in my yard. And I don't know if you can see in the picture, but there is a honeybee um, going to town on that bone set. Doug Talamy helped the National Wildlife Federation develop a great resource to find plants native to your zip code. The website even lists the top 10 species that use those plants as hosts. There are more than 300 native bee species in Pennsylvania and more than 140 native butterfly species in Pennsylvania. Both of those links will give you more resources to learn about those things. Save money, grow your own plants from seed. We are fortunate that we have a Chester County seed swap in January. I hope we get to do that again this year. It was one of my favorite days of the year. Um, you can also winter seed sow native perennial plants. Because most of them need that cold moist stratification, you can put them in pots or put them in milk jugs like little mini greenhouses. Put them outside in December or January and do nothing else. They're just outside, they're open to the elements, they're getting rained on, they're getting snowed on, it's cold, it warms up for that day after Christmas when you can go out in your shorts. Um, it, it's just like they would be out in the wild, except that you know where they are, you labeled them so you remember what they are, and you have control of where you put them once they're bigger. You can also start things indoors under grow lights, but most native plants are a little harder to do that way because they need that longer period of cold moist stratification. Um, or you can direct sow certain things in the spring if they don't need stratification or you've already gone through other processes. Here's an example of my setup for winter seed sowing. I've done the milk jug setup also, um, but I highly recommend using a pencil or a garden marker because permanent marker wears off. And uh, these were put out in December, some in January, and by April, I had, I had that. Um, I had a lot of success. This on the left is Senna, and I repotted it just last month into the bigger pots on the right. Or you can do something small, just indoor um, winter or indoor growing under a grow light, and then transfer it outside into a protected area or a, a little greenhouse. There's nothing better you can do for the birds and the bees than to plant native flowers and trees. Check out anything by Doug Tallamy, I highly recommend. And here are a few pages of resources. There are lots of great books on this topic. And I want to leave you with my favorite quote about native plants by Benjamin Bott in A New Garden Ethic. Your garden is a protest. It is a place of defiant compassion. It is a space to help sustain wildlife and ecosystem function while providing an aesthetic response that moves you. For you, beauty isn't just petal deep, but goes down into the soil, farther down into the aquifer, and back up into the air and for miles around on the backs and legs of insects. You don't have to see soil microbes in action. Just knowing it's possible in your garden thrills you. It's like faith and it frees you to live life more authentically. Your garden is a protest for all the ways in which we deny our life by denying other lives. Plant some natives, be defiantly compassionate. And I promised you that list of nurseries, and here they are. I'm, I'm sure that there are more, but I can speak for all of the ones that are highlighted um, that are fully native. I adore them and get things from them all the time. And some of the ones that are, are and then all of the other ones, that are not highlighted are at least partially native. They do sell natives, sometimes it's cultivars, so you just have to watch. Thank you very much for your attention.
And if you have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, I can answer any questions. Jesse, it's John. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I'd seen your slides before and you've, you've added to them and it was very informative, very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, I, there is at least one question that has come through on the chat. Uh, this is from uh, Suzanne. Her question is this. We have a 20 foot by 20 foot area that we solarized last year. It's blooming well with native wildflowers for pollinators. Is there a time when it should be mowed or do we let it stay for beneficial insects and still, until late winter or early spring? Oh, an excellent question. And the answer is late winter or early spring are the best time and the only time you need to mow a, an established pollinator meadow. The first year is a little tricky. I, I'm not sure when you put your seeds in. Um, the first year after you've put it, so for example, if you put your seeds in in the fall, that whole following year, the spring and summer and fall of the following year, typically you need to mow at about a height of eight inches. And if it's a small patch, like you described, you could probably just take um, a weed whacker. And anytime the meadow gets above 12 inches, you could cut it back down to eight inches. The reason being, you're always trying to suppress those um, non-native, unwanted plants that will blow in on the wind or uh, somehow have survived the solarization process. And where we live, it wants to be a forest. So you're going to have baby maples and baby oak trees and bushes of all kinds that want to try and establish in your pollinator meadow. So that first year, cutting back to eight inches suppresses those types of growths and it allows your native plants to put down deeper roots instead of putting energy into getting bigger as a plant above ground. So after that first year though, after you've gone through kind of that, the, the hardest part of the process, then you only mow one time again around eight inches, you don't really have to go too much lower than that um, at the end of winter or beginning of spring. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from uh, Diana. She's asking if, can we print the nursery list? Okay, so so Diana and, and everyone, what I would say is please do check the North Coventry Township uh, web page. We will work to get that information posted there um, so that it's available to everyone. We have an, another question that's come in on the on the chat from Carol. Uh, can stilt grass be selectively mowed before seeding for some control in addition to mechanical pulling? I noticed that the stilt grass provides some structure for insects, but I would remove it all if I could. <laughs> We yes, all? we would all remove all, it if, all of it if we could. <laughs> yeah, um, stilt grass is really hard to control. Um, definitely at least mowing before it goes to seed is, is wonderful. Hand, anything you can do to get it not to go to seed, um, but it will still be a lot of hand pulling. There's, there's not a great there's just not a great way to combat it, except for keeping on top of it, don't let it go to seed and pull it out. Great, thank you. Um, one question I have, and, and this kind of came up as we were thinking about things we can do within the township um, in terms of promoting more meadows, uh, more natural meadows. Um, and one of the recommendations that I heard uh, from a number of people was, if, if you want to have a, a native meadow that's in a large area and maybe you don't have a way to either chemically 
or physically remove everything that's currently there is simply stop mowing. And I would be curious to know your, your take on that or if you have any other insight about a very, very low maintenance way of, you know, promoting growth of, of natives and creating a meadow. I have done this on my property. I have not mowed areas. Um, what I found is that not a lot of native plants have found their way into those areas, but a lot of things like um, plantain and chicory and uh, thistle and those plants that do bloom and serve as host plants for a few things have found their way in. I have found that when I let tall grasses grow, they provide pollen sources for a lot of the very small bees. Um, so I was interested to see that. I didn't actually think that was going to be something. I've had a lot of um, daisy fleabane come in. That is a native plant. I love it. Uh, it is large. It reseeds very happily. Um, so you will not establish a native meadow that way, but you can have a naturalized area that is going to provide more for nature than turf lawn. Um, so I've done it in certain areas that I wasn't using of my yard anyways. We were not frolicking in that grass area. So we stopped mowing it, let things grow. It's not native, but it is more useful than turf grass. Great, thank you. That's that's a good uh, a good way to put it. <clears throat> All right. Well, at this time, we don't have any other questions that have come in through the chat. Um, but I would just say thanks so much for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, to everyone who's listening, we will certainly work to get the resources that, that Jesse shared up onto uh, the North Coventry uh, website so that they're available to you to take a look at both the uh, internet links as well as some references to books. Um, and we'll uh, hope that, that you find that uh, helpful and useful. Um, uh, so again, thank you, Jesse. Thanks everyone for, for joining us for this. Um, I invite you to join us in about a month's time, Tuesday, August 18th at 7 p.m., um, where we have our next uh, informational webinar.